Well, we are uh, continuing our study in Colossians. If you're new to us this morning, we've been in Colossians for a little while. Uh, we're moving our way through. We're almost at the end. But I'm actually going to jump. In, we should be in chapter 3 still, but I'm going to jump to the final chapter, chapter 4. And the reason I'm going to do that is because Paul emphasizes prayer in this passage. Any, any, any thoughts about why I might be emphasizing prayer this morning? Yeah, 12 hours of prayer. I want us to uh, just kind of be encouraged and hopefully inspired for our 12 hours of prayer this Friday. Uh, and in case you're, you're new and you don't understand 12 hours, we're not asking you to be here for 12 hours. Okay, Lynn will be here, but no one else probably will. Just as long as you, as, as short or as long as you can be here, that's, that's the point, is just to come and spend time with the Lord. Before we read what Paul writes to us in Colossians about prayer, I want us to look at some quotes from some um, notable leaders in the body of Christ uh, to kind of give us, a, 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 a again, more inspiration about prayer. Let's, let's take a look at some of these quotes. Charles Spurgeon said, I would rather teach one man to pray than ten men to preach. John Wesley says, God does nothing except in response to believing prayer. A.J. Gordon said, you can do more than pray after you have prayed, but you can never do more than pray until you have prayed. You may need to read that through a couple times, because the first time I read that, I thought, huh? <laughs> but now it's like, oh, okay, all right. Samuel Chadwick said, the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but he trembles when we pray. Andrew Murray said, beware in your prayers, above everything else, of limiting God, not only by unbelief, but by fancying that you know what he can do. Expect unexpected things above all that we ask or think. And one more from the man who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, John Bunyan. He said, prayer will make a man cease from sin, or sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. You know, I think if we took a survey, I think we would all virtually say that we believe in the importance of prayer. We believe in the power of prayer. But somehow many of us feel inadequate when we pray, and therefore many of us don't pray as much as we know we should. Here are some of the struggles with prayer that we have. We believe we don't know how to pray. You know, I, sometimes the words just don't come to me. You know what I mean? I, I, listen, I think we all feel that way. We believe our prayers are ineffective. You ever feel like, you know, the ceiling to God is about as high as this ceiling here, and they're kind of bouncing back down? And we wonder if God truly hears us. I think we all struggle with those thoughts at one point or another. And, and these, these beliefs are actually lies. They're weapons of the enemy to try and get you to do what those quotes really encourage us to do, and that is to pray. Because the devil hates when we pray. So when we, he puts thoughts into our minds about how ineffective our prayers are and how God's too busy, you know, or how you don't know how to pray the right kind of words, then that limits us from praying, and the devil wins in that regard. Book of Peter, 1 Peter says this, Eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayer. Well, Pastor, I don't feel very righteous. I got to tell you, that's probably for somebody else. That's for you. No, no, no. If you've opened your heart to Jesus, then God sees you as righteous. Can I hear an amen on that one? That's actually a good one. God sees you as righteous if you have opened your heart to Jesus, submitted your life to him. God sees you as a righteous one, irregardless of who are limitations. God isn't looking for professionals to pray. I, I love to tell this story. I've told it before. We have a few people who haven't heard it. Uh, I've, I've been meeting, I was meeting with a young man for a period of time at Starbucks, and I was there to encourage him, and we talked about scripture and whatnot. So this one day I was meeting with him, and we were meeting outside in the patio, and this, uh, this man who was over here in our conversation uh, started to kind of ask if he could, could kind of join us. And I said, sure, you know, come on. So he joined us, and we talked a little bit, and he shared some concerns of his. So when the time was finished, uh, time to wrap up, I said, uh, well, can we, can we pray for you before we, before we leave? And he goes, yeah, that'd be great. So I, I prayed for him and some of the concerns that he expressed, and <clears throat> then we said amen. And he goes, he goes wow, that was, that was really a good prayer. 
And the young man that I've been meeting with says, he's a professional. <laughs> God is not looking for professionals. In fact, that scared me when he said that because <clears throat> Jesus condemned the professionals, did he? Did he not? Because the professionals would pray, and, and, but their hearts were not into it. They would pray these long prayers for show, to show people how much they knew. So their hearts were not toward God. The hearts were toward how it looked in man's eyes. And so Jesus condemned that. So with that in mind, all this about prayer in mind, let's go ahead and look at what Paul writes to us in Colossians chapter 4, beginning with verse 2. And we'll read through verse 4. <clears throat> he says this. He says, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us, too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Paul was literally in prison at this point. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. You notice the word prayer in there a few times? There's this emphasis on prayer. And so I want to look at three essentials that we find really in that first verse, verse 2. And I call them three pillars of prayer. And the first one is this. Be devoted to prayer, Paul says. Be devoted to prayer. You know, the Greek word for devoted means to persevere, to be persistent, to keep on keeping on, to don't stop. Jesus tells a parable, actually, uh, to give us an illustration so we can hang our hats on that hook. You know, what, what does that really mean to keep pressing on? Well, Jesus tells us a story, a parable. It's called the parable of the unjust judge. And I want us to look at that because we're going to learn some things about devotion and to prayer through this parable. So it's out of Luke 18. Jesus is uh, talking to his disciples. Beginning with the verse 1, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should pray and not give up. In other words, pray and be devoted to prayer. Okay? He said, In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, he was honest, right? Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? According to Jesus, the devoted prayer means don't give up. Don't ever say, I've been praying this prayer or for this person, or for this situation, for X number of years. And you know what? It's over. It's done. It's not happening. Okay, maybe God has a different plan, even though it's on my heart to pray for that. I just, you know what? I'm just tired of praying for it. Don't ever do that, Jesus said. And it's interesting in this story, this parable, that Jesus uses a contrast versus a parallel to tell the truth about the kingdom of God. Usually it's a parallel what God is like. This is, a, this is the contrast, the opposite of what God is like. Let's, let, let's take a look at some of the contrast in what Jesus was trying to tell us. So he's saying this. He says, rather than going to an uncaring judge, we are invited to go before a loving father. How, how encouraging is that when, when, when the Bible says, be devoted to prayer, that we're coming to a father who loves us and wants us to come to him. Second point Jesus is telling us is rather than coming, to, coming as a stranger, we are invited as his son or daughter. If you're part of the family of God and you've opened up your heart to Jesus, you are a son or a daughter of the king. You are, you are one of his. And so he invites you to come, not as a stranger like this unjust judge, but as a son, as a daughter. There's a great shot, a photo that was in Life magazine about 55 or 60 years ago. And it's a shot of John F. Kennedy in the White House. Isn't that a great shot? So here he is in the Oval Office, the most powerful place on earth. And he is, at that time, the most powerful man on earth. And who is playing under his desk but his son, John Jr. What a great picture of what God invites us to. God says, come into my throne room. Come on in. 
because you're my son. You might have, there was no limitations to this young man coming into his, well, maybe there were some limitations, you know, but basically it was like, son, come on in. Play under my desk while I talk to world leaders. <laughs> That's the kind of access we have to our Heavenly Father. Come on in. Come on in. Jesus was saying that if the widow can be persistent, Oh, sorry, I skipped ahead, I forgot. There's more things Jesus wants to tell us. Rather than coming as a widow, we come as his bride. We are the bride of Christ, the Bible says. He loves us. We're adorned for him. So rather than a widow who doesn't have a husband, he says, no, you're my bride, come on in. And finally, he's saying to us, rather than coming to a court of law, we come to a throne of grace. God is covered in grace. We are covered in God's grace. So here's what Jesus was saying. Next slide, Amy. Jesus was saying that if the widow can be persistent with an uncaring judge, we certainly should be devoted to prayer based on a loving Father who hears us and will respond out of love for us. You know, a few verses later in the Colossians, Paul gives an example of someone who is devoted to prayer. In verse 12, Epaphras, he writes, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. Now look at this. He is, al he is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Isn't that a great picture? Mm -hmm. Wrestling in prayer. You know, maybe, maybe you feel like you've been wrestling in prayer for things that have been on your heart, a situation that you're facing. But Jesus says, don't give up. It's going to feel like a wrestling match, and sometimes you're going to feel like you get pinned. But keep on wrestling, keep on fighting, never give up. Never, um, and my son-in-law, who's a former wrestler, would appreciate this, never tap out, right? Don't give up. Don't give up. You know, in Revelation, which I read from earlier, God you know, pulls back the curtain to show us what happens to our prayers. Because sometimes, we, do they evaporate into thin air? You know, we're, you know, I'm praying and I don't, I'm not seeing anything happening. What's going on with my prayers? Well, 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 God gives John a revelation as he pulls back the curtain. Look what happens to your prayers. Beginning in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 6 in Revelation. He says, Then I saw a lamb, that's Jesus, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. He had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Now look at this. Each one had a harp and they were holding golden bowls full of incense. Read that with me. Which are the prayers of the saints. Those are your prayers. Those are your prayers that have been going up. If you've been wrestling, just keep on wrestling. Because those bowls are getting full. They're getting filled up. They're not going into thin air. There is no expiration date on prayers. Isn't that good news? Yeah. You ever clean out your refrigerator and go, ooh, oh, that was a month old, you know? That doesn't happen with prayer. God doesn't say that with your prayers. Oh, that was prayed six years ago. We got it old. Give me something fresh. No, they're being stored up. You're being contained in those golden bowls. I love the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. We usually talk about them at, at uh, Christmas time. But Zechariah and Elizabeth, who were going to be the parents of John the Baptist, they had, they had been married for many, many, many years. They're well past childbearing years. The Bible says they were righteous people, holy in God's sight. And, and what you wanted back in those days especially was to have children. So you know that they were praying for children. It was on their hearts. And so over decades, decades, decades past, praying for a child, praying for a son to carry on the name, praying for a daughter to marry and carry on kids and so forth. Nothing happened. So they got to the point in their life when they just said, okay, well, it's over. She's past childbearing years. I'm old. Okay, it's done. That's it. And I, I love it because, because at one point, at some point, an angel comes to Zechariah and he says, the first thing he says to him, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard. Not your prayers, his very first prayer that he prayed probably 40, 50 years ago. That's been heard. And you know what? You kept praying, building on top of that first prayer. 
and the golden bowl overflowed. It is time for your prayer to be answered. Keep filling up, loved ones, keep filling up those bowls, okay? Okay, okay, keep filling up those bowls, keep wrestling, don't tap out, right, Ryan? Don't tap out, there you go. Second thing, second pillar of prayer is be watchful in prayer, Paul tells us. Be watchful. Short, uh, shortly before Jesus was crucified, he was with uh, his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. And this is what he told them in Matthew 26, 38. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Keep watch. So what does it mean to be watchful in prayer? This is a very simple definition. It's being aware of the needs or concerns with you and with others that require prayer. That's it. Just be, be aware, be aware of what's going on you in your life as well as what's going on with others. God wants to use you as a prayer warrior for situations that arise that need prayer. Remember that quote that says, God doesn't move except by believing prayer. So he's going to use you, his hands and feet, body of Christ, to pray for situations that he wants to move in. But mysteriously, and don't ask me why, he chooses us to pray, asking him, and then he moves. Now, let's say somebody is really bugging you. Oh, that person bugs me. Man, he bugs me. Hopefully it's not your spouse sitting next to you. No elbows, okay? No elbows. <laughs> maybe, just maybe, I'm suggesting to you, and this is, I'm speaking to me too, that maybe God is using that person's you know, whatever they're, they're doing to irritate you, so that it has your attention that maybe that person needs prayer. Maybe I'm feeling bugged because God's saying, hey, hey, John, pray for that person because I'm getting your attention because you're bugged. So there's something in that person's life that needs prayer, so I want you to pray, and the only way I can get your attention is by bugging you. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's situations like that that come up that we don't even think about it. We just walk by the flesh and go, ah, that person, now, ah, write them off. And God's like, oh, you had the opportunity to pray for them. I'll go and have them bug somebody else now so they can pray for them. <laughs> so do your friend a favor, okay? Just start praying. And You know, we have a, a watchman ministry. There's somebody right now walking around the property, keeping watch over the property. And uh, as a result of what well, we had really planned this before, but the day we really launched and, and talked about security around the church, that day... Someone came into the parking lot and broke into two cars and stole some stuff from the cars. And you think, oh, we're tucked back in the canyon, we're safe, you know, nothing's going to happen. And sure enough, someone took advantage and broke in. So now we have watchmen, and they are here to keep an eye on things, to watch and intervene when necessary. I'm very thankful for them. So when you see them, they give up being here so that they can keep a watch on things. So be sure and be thankful to people who like that who do that. But spiritually, that's what we are to do. Just keep watch. Be aware of situations that need prayer so we can intervene like they are keeping a watch on things to intervene. God wants to use us as prayer warriors to intervene in situations that need prayer. You know, how differently the world would be, I think, if the church over the last 2,000 years really took prayer seriously. How different I believe the world would be right now. We are called to be watchmen. So being watchful also includes praying the way God directs us to pray and doing what God says after we pray. It's part of the whole process of, of being a watchman is being watchful for the way God directs us to pray and doing what God says after we pray. You know, we need eyes to see as watchmen do, but we also need ears to hear what the Spirit is telling us in terms of how to pray and then, um, and then how to follow up after we pray. Let me give an example, because that that's can be like, okay, well, what do you mean? Let me show you. Luke 17, here's an example, beginning with verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. And as he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance. And they called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. That's their prayer request. So in a sense, they were praying to Jesus, right? Have pity on us. 
they're asking to be cleansed from their leprosy. It was obvious because of, because of the condition that they were in. When he, Jesus, saw them, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. <clears throat> How many of you believe that Jesus could have just, at that moment, just spoken a word and said, Okay, you guys are cleansed. Boom. Done. Right? He could have done that. He's done, he did that in other situations. You're healed. Boom. In this situation, Jesus goes, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And it says they were healed. They were cleansed as they went. Jesus gave instructions as part of their prayer request. There was something conditional they needed to do. And that's really important when we talk about praying, is to be open to a condition that, that the Lord would reveal to you or that somebody else would, would, God uses people, right, to talk to us as well. So be, be open and be aware of the fact that somebody might be speaking like the answer. You're praying for something and somebody's saying something to you and you're like, be quiet. You know, I'm, I'm asking God. And like God's saying, I'm telling that person to tell you. There was a, a situation where our, our bookkeeper's husband um, uh, was, was, had a lot of physical, had, well, yeah, more had now, physical issues. He had sciatica issues, um, all sorts of pain in his body and stuff. And they were giving him, he had tons of medications, she said, just tons of medications. So this, this other fellow in his church told him, you know, that he's been experiencing a lot of relief from pain and other things through juicing like organic vegetables. And so this guy, his name is Todd, began to uh, juice vegetables, you know, do a lot of juicing. And so, I don't know how long, I don't, I don't remember what she said in terms of span of time, but, you know, he, like, he lost like 30 pounds, and, and he's off most of his medications. His pain is gone just from doing something like that that somebody else told him about in response to a prayer that he's been praying. The person said, try juicing, and he did it. Jesus, go, show yourself to the priest, and they were cleansed. Active obedience is often required. So being watchful in prayer includes listening to what God would direct us to do as we pray. So we are to be devoted in prayer, consistent, keep at it, don't stop. We are to be watch, watchful in prayer, keep, and keep eyes and ears open. And thirdly, we are to be thankful in prayer. Let's continue the story of the lepers because that's where Thanksgiving comes into the story, beginning with verse 15. One of them, one of the lepers, when he saw that he was healed, he came back, praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him, and he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go, your faith has made you well. One in ten. That's a pretty bad percentage. Baseball season started. And at the end of the season, if somebody's batting one in ten, guess what? Back to the minors, you know? Or you're on the bench. You're going to ride the pine for a while. It's not a very good percentage. And I wonder, I wonder in our prayer lives how many, how many requests that we, we give to God, that we put before God. And that's fine. The Bible says, let your requests be made known. But in comparison to the amount of times we say thank you, is it, is it one in ten? Do we come back one time out of ten when we thank God for an answer to prayer? So often we'll pray, you know, Lord, you know, keep Kelly safe on a her, on her race, her bicycle race, which she's doing right now, as a matter of fact. And then she comes back and sometimes we go, oh, she's back. God's like, hello. You know, do we, do, do we, do we thank God? Do, is our prayer life marked with plenty of thanksgiving? And I, I think this. I think our prayer life should be marked more by thanksgiving than by requests. And I'm not saying you shouldn't ask, because we should ask. But we, our thanksgiving should be, should be more numerous than the times that we just ask God for stuff. What if somebody constantly came to you, consistently came to you, and just asked for stuff? Just ask. Just ask. And then you, you're like, okay, that's fine. That's what grandkids do, but you know, we love them anyway. <laughs> they just ask. They just ask. You have to tell them to say thank you. And it's like, uh, no, what if they did that? And you, and you did stuff for them, and they weren't your grandkids. And you did that for them, and, and there wasn't a thank you. And then after a while, you're thinking, 
you know, thinking, come on, you know? God's got a bigger heart than we do. But I imagine the father at some point is going to go, you know, wow, wow, I'm doing all this for you. Where's, where's the thanksgiving? Where's the thankful heart? Because it really does show a condition of our heart. That's what it shows. God's not up there getting mad and jealous and stuff. It just shows in a condition of our heart if we're not being thankful for what God has, doing, has done in our lives. Paul writes this in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Be joyful always. Pray continually, mean to be devoted to prayer. In everything, give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus concerning you. I read that wrong, but you know what I mean. Be devoted. Be watchful. Be thankful, the Bible says. In everything, give thanks. That's God's will for us. Do we will? You want to know God's will? That's it in that, in that one passage. Be thankful. Be joyful. Pray continually. And that, and you're fulfilling God's will for your life. Speaking of grandkids, I was driving my granddaughter Sloan home um, because she had to be with her mom. We were watching the other two, the two older ones. They were going to spend the night. So Rhonda was staying with them, and I was, I was going to uh, drive Sloan. They live in, in uh, uh, Simi Valley. I was going to say Thousand Oaks, but Simi Valley. Wait, right? Simi, yeah. They live in Simi. And so I, I drove her home. This is at nighttime, and so trying to keep her awake, you know, talking to her in the back seat, you know, so she can get home awake and be with her mom. So I drop her off, and then on the way back, I reach for the, um, I reach for the, um, the radio. In fact, let's just show that picture of Sloan. I don't want to wait any longer. Here she is. Just, you know, our <laughs> grandparents' prerogative to show the grandkids just every once in a while. So she got her good looks from her mom and her grandmother. So. So I'm, I drop little Sloan off, and I'm coming back home, and I reach for the radio to turn the radio on. And the moment the radio comes on, I just feel like, that's noise, John. That's spend the time wisely. So I turn the radio off. And what came to my mind, and this is actually before I prepared this message, what came to my mind is just spend the time all the way back from Simi Valley thanking God for things in my life. And so I just started, things just started coming to mind. I thought, wow, I have a lot to be thankful for. I do a lot of grumbling, and I realize, I sh you know, I have a lot to be thankful for. So I was out loud. There's no, hey, thank you, you know, thank you for my family and my kids and my in-laws. And, th you know, it just went on and on and on. And by the time I got home, my heart was lifted up. I was encouraged. I felt good. Why don't we thank God more? Because it lifts us up. There's a reason why God says, be joyful always. You know, pray, pray continually. Be thankful. Why? It lifts us up. And it reminds us of how good God is and all the good things that God has done and will do. Let's be thankful people. You know, even if God never answered another prayer, we can give him thanks because our sins are forgiven and we have eternal life with him. Look what Paul writes earlier in Colossians. He says, Joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. That's a good thing to thank God for, right? God, I get to share an eternal inheritance with you. My own rest of my life might be falling apart, but you know what? Come heaven, come eternal life, I'm going to be with you, and I get to share in that with you. If nothing else, and God does a lot more, but we can thank God for that. So be devoted to, in prayer, loved ones. Be devoted. Don't give up. Don't tap out. Keep pressing ahead because you know that those golden bowls. you got your name on one of those bowls. It's filling up. Be watchful as to how God wants to use you to pray. Because he's going to use you to pray, not just for your own situations, but for those of the people around you. And be open to as he directs, even through someone else or through some other avenue. Respond as he leads, and then be thankful. Express that offering to the Lord. Tell the Lord, spend some time as you are in prayer time. Just don't read your list of requests. Spend some time thanking him, thanking him for his goodness, thanking him that he hears you. Thank you, thank him for all the things in your lives. You know, we do, um, we do a lot of fun things, important things here on, on the campus and through the church. Uh, just let me recap a few of them. Uh, Christmas Eve candlelighting service is, is a favorite of many of us. It's a, it's a wonderful time. It's going to change this year being in here instead of over in the sanctuary. But it's a wonderful, wonderful time. Uh, we did a marriage retreat last, uh, last year, and it was a wonderful time. We had a great time with the marrieds that were here. Uh, the women just last week did a tea and good reports, just wonderful, wonderful things were happening. 
So we do a lot of important things, a lot of really, really good things. But can I share with you the most important thing, the one most important thing that we do every single year? And I mean this with all of my heart, and that is the 12 hours of prayer. Nothing happens except through believing prayer. So we can have all the merger treats in the world. We can do all the, all the teas and, you know, all the teas from here to China. But you know what? It doesn't measure up in the scheme of us as a community coming and spending whatever amount of time over a span of 12 hours pouring our hearts out to the Lord. And I just think that's like a laser beam of spiritual breakthrough that's going to be happening in this church and in our lives. That's the most important thing. Do you want to put that slide up? The theme is in Christ. I love that picture of the little girl, you know, tucked into the lion's paws. 12 hours of prayer, Friday, April 5th. It's from 9 to 9, CE building, which is the building right behind us. Uh, in the rooms, it's going to be individual rooms. I think six of them set up for prayer, reflection, Bible reading. You know, it's going to be multiple seats in every room. So, you know, just come on in. The Lynn will be there. You'll have some information to direct you. But God, God is always, always moving in a powerful way during those 12 hours of prayer. You know why? Because he can't wait for his bride, his children, his sons and daughters to come and spend time with him. So he puts a lot of energy through Lynn especially, but through others to set this up so that God can meet with us. It's an important time. And I would really urge you to carve out some time on Friday. Don't let, by the way, don't, you know, I can get mad about this because I'm not going to mad at you. It's the devil because the devil is going to distract you. Oh, I don't feel that well today. Kind of woke up with a headache. Forget about it. Come. Amen. Right? Amen. Uh, I've, you know, gosh, I have so much on my mind. I got so much, on, yeah, I got so much going on. I'll, I'll pray from home. No. <laughs> it's here. You come here and pray because God has an appointment. He has a meeting with us and he wouldn't have set this up if it wasn't important to come and to pray. You know, when Jesus drove the money changers out of the temple, he said, my house, my temple, they said, my house will be called a house of what? Prayer. A house of prayer. Now, God doesn't, die, God doesn't reside in temples anymore. He did in the Old Testament in the temple. His presence was there. We are, the Bible says now, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? Yes. We are God's house. So get this. My house, nudge the person next to you, house, my house would be called a house of prayer, house of prayer. That's what he's saying. We are his house of prayer, but we are so busy, just like the temple, he got mad, not at the people, maybe he did get mad at the people, they were changing, he did get mad at them, because they were changing, they they, they 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 were, they were, doing things they shouldn't have been doing. They were making it a marketplace instead of a house of prayer. God's calling us to be houses of prayer. Right? For his glory, to accomplish his purposes, so that his kingdom is more advanced in this church, certainly, but in this valley, throughout the state, and around the world. Folks, we have influence. Let's use it for his kingdom. Amen? Amen. Lord, we love you, and we thank you for just the awesome ability you've given us to come in prayer to your throne of grace. And Father, you use us, and I I really don't fully comprehend that, but you use us to be people who move your hand in situations that need your hand to be moved. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the gift of prayer. And Father, may we see ourselves, each one of us, as houses of prayer. That you're calling us to be people who pray, who intercede, who are your kingdom on this earth to advance your kingdom in situations that need your touch. So Jesus, forgive us for taking it lightly. Forgive me for taking it lightly at times, Lord. And so, Lord, may, may we be people that mobilize Friday. And not just Friday, Lord, but, but every day. Lord, may our prayer life just take a, take, take a jump. But certainly on Friday, we pray, Father, for a deep move of your spirit in that building as we, as we are playing in a place we haven't prayed before in the CE building, may that be a powerful time of encountering your presence for each and every person that comes. And Father, may your glory, may your glory reign and rule over that building 
on Friday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Father, we thank you. Thank you for that opportunity that we have. And Father, may we have ears to hear all what you call us to pray about. And may we follow after you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.